Hello, everybody out there in podcast land. Welcome to another fine, super, splendid, fabulous episode of Film Knobs. I am your co-host, Barry B-Man Benning, and across from me sits... I am Richard, the Morganator Morgan. And we are ready to get this show underway. I- I'm pretty excited. I'm ready to find out what is coming up next in our uh, countdown of top franchises of all time. But before we do that, uh, let me ask you, it's been a, a, a minute or two since we've seen one another. So is, is there anything that you have either seen or that is going on that has got your attention, is on your radar? Toy Story 4 comes out this weekend. It does indeed. It does indeed. And maybe not a moment too soon, right? Hopefully it can save Hollywood. <laughs> it could save maybe uh, this summer. We've had a string of uh, underperforming sequels. Mm-hmm. Maybe finally, oh, oh Lord, please let it be true that <laughs> that finally sequels may start to at least shrink down. Although, hey, Toy Story 4 is a sequel, right? And um, But the early reviews here look pretty good compared the, to Dark Phoenix. or The Lion King is around the corner, so. Yeah, oh, that one. It's going to be big, I think, regardless. Mm-hmm. But mm, hopefully they've got it figured out. I'm kind of, if you can tell, I'm, you know, I'm not the biggest sequel fan. I believe that we need to, we need to start coming up with more, more original stories, you know, so that we can have sequels. <laughs> exactly. For, for our future generations, right? I mean, we've got to have something that our future generations <laughs> down the line can, can rip off and make money on, right? What else? What else has been going on? Uh, I guess uh, that is, to me, that's the, the big news, though, like I said, is the underperforming sequels mm-hmm. of, of this summer. I, I want to say I'd heard where the box office uh, is down, you know, 7 8% from from last year right now. Uh, I can't verify that at the moment, but uh, you know, I think that's right. And isn't Disney on target to maybe sweep? What thirty thirty five? Well, right now, right now, the last I'd heard, I think they're at thirty five percent of the. They have, they have gathered thirty five percent of the box office so far. And hey, Lion King hasn't been released yet. Toy Story four coming out this weekend. Star movie called Star Wars Mm -hmm. out Christmas. What else? Uh, Artemis Fowl. Artemis Fowl. uh, Maleficent, uh, Mistress of Evil, right? <laughs> yeah, the the seemingly R rated. It sounds like a very R rated uh, movie to me. But uh, Frozen, two. oh, Fro- yeah, <laughs> Frozen Two. Hey, maybe they can hit forty percent. Is it? Is that possible? That's almost scary. I haven't seen. I haven't gone to see anything last. I guess week or so. Uh, I saw. About as strange a movie as you can possibly think of. A few nights ago, I guess, a week or so ago, on, um, I believe it was on TCM's Underground Movies, you know, Friday night, uh, a little movie called Sometimes Aunt Martha Does Dreadful Things. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like an ominous title. Uh, well, it's kind of an ominous movie. It's, uh, it's a bit nutso. Uh, it's, like this ultra low budget movie shot down, I think around Miami in the in the early seventies, and um, well, for all of you purveyors of the weird out there and the strange, you, know, you might want to check that one out. It's got uh, it's got a crazy premise and and some wild performances, and I mean, I'm not saying it's good, but um, I mean, it's interesting. That's about... (laughs) What's it called again? Sometimes. Sometimes Aunt Martha does dreadful things. (laughs) And she does indeed... She does some dreadful things in this movie for sure. Hmm. But from dreadful... Let's move from dreadful to to our friend. Let's step into the franchises again. Um, Maybe maybe it's, it's been what? It's been a week or two since we've gotten together... Uh, to do an episode, so hopefully we're not too hungover, right? From, from uh, <laughs> nice, <laughs> a lack nice. of, yeah. Can you see? Can you see where I'm leading uh, to? 
Our first franchise that we'll talk about today, where does it come in at? What is it, by the way? It's the Hangover franchise. Oh, really? And it comes at number 53. Fit. Now, and again, we, we've ranked these by the franchise gross, adjusted gross. Yeah, I, I think that's the, the way to go. I like, I like it. It kind of gives us a, a better understanding of, you know, I think truly how, how popular something was. We do it. And also shows us why sequel is is so popular. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It's not, it's probably not the overwhelming um, quality of a lot of these projects. Now, the first hangover, that was a funny move. It was inventive. Yeah. Creative. Uh, put, um, if I'm not mistaken, put Zach Galifianakis kind of on the map mm-hmm. as well as uh, Ken Jeong. And it was a, uh, it helped Bradley Cooper, you know, move up as he was moving kind of up the ranks of uh, stardom in Hollywood. It, it certainly uh, certainly helped him as well. Can't say the same for the two sequels. I, I don't. <laughs> they're pretty. <laughs> they're pretty unfunny. <laughs> you know, they put bigger budgets into them and uh, they were just. You know, We've seen even. a trend. <laughs> And that seems to happen. That seems to happen quite a bit. Yeah, hey, we're successful. Let's throw mo- more money at it and less time on, on a script. <laughs> People will come to anything. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes it seems like this, that's true. All right. So the first Hangover movie came out in t- 2009. And uh, it grossed over $550 million at the box office. And the second one came out in 2011 and it made over 662 million dollars and the third one came out in 2013 and well it still did okay i mean it made 394 million dollars hey but you know in the hangover also it kind of revived a mike tyson there for a little it bit did. too did it, it not? did so oh uh, yeah yeah everybody came out roses on the first one at least um, so what have we got coming up from, from the hangover? How about home alone? Home alone. There we go. Uh, Macaulay Culkin. Mm-hmm. At least for the first two. For the first two. Right. Yeah. The first two. I can't rem- I can't remember who came in <laughs> for the, there was the, there were three, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I didn't, I don't think I made it. Well, I saw bits and pieces of the third one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know that it exists. Right. It's the, right there. I'm pretty sure there is a home alone three somewhere out there in the universe. I'm just, I've been briefly acquainted with it, but, uh, what, what did you think of the hangover? That was, well, be man, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, wh- Oh, <laughs> oops. Yeah. Well, maybe I've got a bit of a hangover, you know, <laughs> myself today. What did you think of home alone? I saw it when it first came out in the theater and it's one of those movies that it's a classic to you. It's you have fond memories of it. Most people feel that way, but you know, you know how I roll, Morganator. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to I'm here to go against the flow. Uh, there were parts of it that I, I like, but I, you know, I can remember thinking, "Wow, I feel like I should really you know like this movie more." But I. Because it's it's kind of like you know it's a, like a live action Looney Tunes movie, right? right? It's mm-hmm. you know it's it's uh, it's Wally Coyote you know trying to catch the Road Runner and just getting absolutely murderized you know time after time, but uh... <laughs> we had this discussion with someone a while back about the comparison of Home Alone basically being a child's version of Die Hard. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you got the lone hero protecting the home front from <laughs> right. from robbers. So together, Joe Pesci and uh, Daniel Stern together make up <laughs> Alan Rickman. Together. Right. <laughs> how many? How, unless, many, how unless, many Joe Pesci's and and Daniel Stern's does it take to make an Alan Rickman? Unless competent. Oh, certainly. <laughs> Although I, I get you know the same. You know, they, they all meet kind of the same. True. They, they all True. fail. They True. all fail. Uh, so what kind of number have we got for uh, for Home Alone? Okay, so Home Alone came out in 1990. 
to the tune of nine hundred and twenty four million dollars. There we go. Adjusted nine twenty four for uh, a comedy Mm -hmm. about a kid, you know, taking it to a couple of inept criminals. Mm -hmm. Those days are gone. (laughs) Or at least right now they seem to be. (laughs) Which, you know, I see why they made a second one which came out two years later, 1992. It didn't do nearly as well. So it made almost six, almost $650 million. Oh, wow. How, yeah. Hmm. It's a wonder they made it there. <laughs> what was, by the way, what are the bud, the adjusted budgets for, for both of those movies? Could you tell me that? Let's see. The first one was just over $29 million. Right. The second one was just over $36 million. <sighs> And the third one, sadly, was over fifty million. Well, the third one without Macaulay Culkin, right? Somehow, somehow, right. it cost fifteen million more dollars to make, uh-huh. and grossed how much for the third one? Um, adjusted, it didn't even make its budget back. Wow! Wow! So, yeah, you know, that's... T- tack on P and A. So it, on top of that, right? And it it got killed. Well, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I, I like I say I've I've been I was vaguely, you know, I bumped into it in the the movie verse vaguely, and then I I ricocheted off pretty quickly. So it it wasn't a straight to video. I mean, apparently it, it no, had it, a, had a th- it, theatrical yeah, it had release. A, well, uh, I mean, you know, look at the money those first two made. That was gonna have. I don't care how terrible a movie it was, it was going to be released into the theaters. So I wonder if they would, you know, reboot Home Alone like an adult version of <laughs> have Macaulay Culkin. Well, it, well, you know, I don't know, I don't know what Macaulay's up to these days. You know, I remember he kind of had a little bit of, you know, trouble times during his teen and early adulthood years. But uh, yeah, maybe. Look, come on, it's that seems to be. They'll uh, remake or reboot anything these days. Why not? <laughs> why not bring? Why not bring his character back in? You know, assisted living or something where <laughs> it may not be quite that old yet. But I don't think he's at the AARP level. <laughs> oh, all right. What's uh? So moving along. <laughs> How about number 50? We have The Conjuring. The Conjuring. Well, that, uh, that's a- appropriate to talk about, too, in that uh, we're just a couple of weeks away, I guess, from um, the newest movie in the Conjuring universe, uh, Annabelle. I can't even remember the good lens. I can't remember. Annabelle what's... Returns? No. C- comes Home. Annabelle Comes Home. That's right. I know... I loved the first Conjuring. I'll tell you that. I thought the, the first Conjuring, my wife and I, she doesn't do horror movies very much. We uh, both really, really liked that movie. Kind of scared me a little bit. And uh, you know, I th- I, the impact of of how effective a horror movie that was might be dulled a little bit by some of the sequels within that universe. You know, the Nun, um, not you know, <laughs> wasn't very. Wasn't very scary, and I haven't seen. As a matter of fact, I haven't seen the the other Annabelle movie. So I guess I'm gonna have to. I'll have to try to do a double feature of those before I catch the third one. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if there's, you know, a flow of narrative to where you have to see the first two. But I'm assuming there would be if it's a continuation or if it's a standalone. Well, I think maybe. I, I'm not for sure. I, I want to say that I'd heard that you didn't necessarily have to see Annabelle to, you know, to see Annabelle creation because they've kind of, I think they're going back and forth a little bit in time. Um, hey, I'm a completist, you know, I kind of want to see all of it anyway, <laughs> right? But um, um, I, I know that um, the two stars, Vera Farmiga and Patrick Wilson, are are back for this one, so... Um, you know, my, my curiosity is, uh, even though, like I said, the last, I, I guess yeah, the conjuring two was okay. And uh, the nun was even, <laughs> was not as okay. Although it wasn't horrible. Uh, 
I am interested in this one. Oh, wait, and, and there's going to be, I, I guess they've already, I'm mean, for sure, right, there's going to be a Conjuring 3 come out next year. I That's think. what I have. So, I know that you will not probably, you don't, have you seen any of them? No. 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 I, I don't do horror, usually. You don't, I know, we've, we've. We've gonna, we've got, I've got to do something to get you into the horror. Look, look how many of the horror, you know, how many. I, I'm are, missing out, apparently. You are. You're missing. I mean, granted, you may sleep better at night, <laughs> <laughs> but you need sleep. Uh, just out of curiosity, what did the, what did the original Conjuring conjure up at the box office? All right, let's see. Again. It was released in 2013. Wow, and, that movie is six years old. Oh. And it made over. Three hundred and forty-six million at the box office adjusted, off of a twenty-two million dollar budget, mm-hmm. and it looks like so. I'm looking at these now. Wow, all of these movies in this Conjuring universe are pretty consistent with their uh, gross, right? Uh, I mean, so three forty-six for the Conjuring, um, Conjuring two three twenty-nine. Annabelle two seventy five, Annabelle creation, what three seventeen three eighteen, the nun three sixty eight. That's all. Mm-hmm. Well, the nun at three sixty eight. Mm-hmm. That's actually the most. So the nun, which is by most accounts maybe the weakest of all of them, or one of the weakest, actually has the highest gross, which I guess goes to to show that, you know. Um, several movies deep into into this franchise uh people are i guess generally overall happy with it with the franchise to for the nun to have um you know have made that kind of money that's true but it's also true at least according to the next movie franchise on our list is that the audience out there loves buddy cop movies buddy cop movies so there's, a, I guess, a few to to choose from. Which one, which one makes it into what's this going to be like? Number what? Number forty seven. Forty seven. Lethal Weapon. You know, Lethal Weapon is the the series, the cop buddy series that really kind of cemented, you know, I, I think the popularity of that. Um, a couple of years before that, when you had forty eight hours with. Uh, Nolte and and Eddie Murphy. I know Eddie Murphy was was technically a, a convict in that, but that's you know right. kind of the same the general mm-hmm. idea, and uh, and that um, you know led to th- this was this was, Lethal Weapon though was the eight hundred pound gorilla in the room, I guess uh, as far as as far as the genre of of movies go. It's what everybody thinks about, you know? right? Exactly, Riggs and Murtaugh. <laughs> right, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, they they inspired certainly several that come down the line, a couple that we've talked about before, mm-hmm. Rush Hour, certainly uh, one of those. Yeah, I, I remember really, I enjoyed the heck out of that first one. You had, you know, I guess that was, that really, now Mel Gibson had made a, a couple of, I guess, successful movies before that, but this was the movie that just kind of set him into the, into the stratosphere as mm-hmm. far as, yeah. And Danny Glover as his partner, you know, also great in that movie. Had had wonderful, a couple of wonderful villains in it. Uh, Gary Busey, you right. know. Yeah, as Mr. as Mr. Joshua. Right, Mr. Joshua. And then you had Mitchell Ryan was, I guess he was the, the overlord, right? He was, Mr. Joshua was working for uh, Mitchell Ryan as the general in that movie. Yeah, that's... um. A lot of terrific action scenes in them. I, I really like. You toss in Joe Pesci for you know some comic relief. Yeah, yeah. I think that was you know part of the reason why that that series kept being successful. They added him, you know, in the second one, and and, and that was a, a really good addition. Um, and then what? Uh, who else uh, came in after that? Rene uh, Russo. Rene Russo. L- love interest. Right, oh, Rene Russo, and. Um, um, Jet Li. Jet Li. What he came in the the fourth, fourth one. The fourth one, right? Yeah, that's a solid franchise. What kind of what kind of dough are we talking about? 
uh, with each individual one? Well, the first one came in at just under two hundred and seventy million back in nineteen eighty seven, and then in nineteen eighty nine, the sequel. I guess almost doubled. Wow, punched it up a good deal, and yeah, just two years later shows you shows you how much how well liked that movie mm-hmm. was the first one, and then what? Well, and even um, it looks like even more three years later for Lethal Weapon mm-hmm. three, what five seventy nine basically, mm-hmm. and then the fourth one dropped back a little, <laughs> dropped back dropped back to four forty five. But still, you know, look, look at the budgets. Now, granted. The fourth one had the highest budget of what all of them. What the heck? <laughs> wow. All right. Tell our tell our good friends out there in podcast land <laughs> how the budgets increased on this series. Wow. This is this is Holly this is Hollywood working. All right, so the adjusted budgets, right, for the first one was just over thirty three million. Right. For the second one it was just over thirty million. So it's somehow le- somehow less for the second right. one. Right. The third one was just over sixty three million. And the fourth one jumped up to two hundred and eighteen million. Uh, yeah, I w- there's some creative things going on there. That may be a story. <laughs> in of itself. That's the story that I may have to go, you know, go out and look for. I'm, I'm really surprised that the second one, you know, came in a little less than the first on the budget. You know, did did Gibson and and um, Glover decided to take a you know, percentage gross money instead of <laughs> instead of upping their salary. Uh, Maybe I mean considering that it almost doubled. <laughs> right. If they did, that was a very uh, you know. a very wise move, right? If if it did, for <laughs> sure. Well, yeah, that's a solid series. Speaking of giant gorillas, how about King Kong coming in at number forty four on our list? King Kong. Yeah. Okay. All right, I've got. I may have a little bit of a problem with with this being. You know, to me, there's so many years apart with, say, from the the original King mm-hmm. Kong, the 1933 original classic, and you know these other movies. It's almost like it's not. You know, they're not really interrelated. At least, not yet. Now, you know, coming up, we'll have Godzilla versus Kong maybe next year. Although now I've heard that that might be. Because this last Godzilla movie didn't perform mm-hmm. near as well, that they may be bumping that puppy back to you know make it better to well to uh, yeah to put a little space between you know this underperforming mm-hmm. Godzilla movie and and the next one because you know they had visions of their own universe of course and it may be trending towards more like the. Uh, what would the monster verse, the universal uh, monster that's just basically, you know, dead in the water. But anyway, yeah, I don't really consider a lot of these Kong, you know, you had, again, the original Kong and then the remake, you know, and you had a, some really, uh, some, you know, some other little crappy 1960s uh, movies. And some of them don't even look, I, I'm seeing. I see the list here. There's there's five or yeah, there's five here. Mm-hmm. But there were even more, you know, uh, little King Kong movies in the '60s that I don't even see in here. So, uh, out of curiosity's sake, so the, what what did the original Kong? What would it have made today? Okay, adjusted gross, it would have made over 195 million at the box office. Off of a thirteen million dollar budget, mm-hmm. I actually thought it'd be even more, maybe a little bit, because that's certainly a. I mean, that is a staple, is one of the greatest horror, and rightfully so. That is one of the greatest. Well, yeah, well, I don't know how horror, how much horror there is, but that's just a great, that's just terrific story. Um. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So, so that's my. I'll, you know, that's all the crabbing I'm going to do about, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Oh, wait a minute though. No, that's not all the crabbing I'm going to do because it, am I looking at the next one on our, our list that, uh, that we're going to talk about? Uh, am I seeing that right? Is it the mummy? Oh, 
you saw that, huh? Yeah, I, I, I did. I'm not, I'm not, I know your feelings for the mummy, so I was going to try to. So, so, but all right. So, I'm going to be very curious. Let's go into the individual. Let's look in the individual movies for the mummy. For franchise. the mummy, because look, you know, it says four, right? I think I see four there, and then we've got, um, because I know there were, uh, there were numerous mummy movies from Universal in the 1930s and 1940s. And then the atrocious. <laughs> well, all right, maybe an atrocious maybe a little too. too it's, a, it's a little harsh. Too too harsh. But to me, I didn't care. Yeah, you know, I didn't care for the reboot of. I didn't care for any of those. Yeah, you see. So where where is the nineteen? If King Kong is on here and the nineteen thirty three right. Kong, and then a couple of whichever you know whichever the smaller Kongs are on, why isn't the the nineteen thirty three um, the Mummy, or 1932, actually, I think. Why is it in on here? And then you had, like, The Mummy Returns, and um, I can't remember. There was, like, you know, The <laughs> Mummy's Tomb. Uh, there, there's a million of them. But all we've got here is is the uh, Brendan Fraser's mug, and uh, <laughs> and I can't remember who, who directed those. Stephen Summers, I believe. I, oof. Okay, all right. Um, I'll get off. <laughs> or Morganators look at me like I've, I have uh, blown a gasket, which I may have. <laughs> it's the B Man rant. The B Man rant. I'm on. I'm on today. <laughs> uh, I do see that the 1999. I was about to say the original Mummy. Far from it. But the 1999 Mummy made a hefty adjusted gross of 637 million dollars mm-hmm. off of a, a 122 million dollar budget well they kind of took a you know that was the first in this you know, the modern mummy mm-hmm. movies 122 million you know it, that, that was in 1999 that mm-hmm. was a, a little bit of a risk i guess and what came after uh, well the mummy returns then the, the scorpion king yeah <laughs> <laughs> Well, the Mummy Returns made a, a solid six hundred twenty-six million. Scorpion King not quite as successful. That was a miss. Uh, I guess as much as a two hundred thirty-four million dollar gross can you know can miss off of a what an eighty-five million dollar budget. Right. Yeah, that was a that was not a good movie at all. And then finally, what in two thousand eight, the Mummy Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, which I'm I think you saw right, mm-hmm. and you. Did not like. No. It, I liked it more than, I guess, the Scorpion King, but it, it was okay. Then did you see the first, did you see the the, the, the 1999 Mummy and the, the Mummy? Uh, yeah, I've seen all of them. Well, you're not very consistent in your I don't go to horror movies. Uh, although, these aren't. They're not straight up horror. I mean, well, they're, they're, yeah, there's horror elements. They're horror elements, but they're more, yeah, they're more of almost like an action adventure, right? Special effects movie than, yeah, than not horror, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Please send all hate mail <laughs> to Richard the Morganator Morgan, Kara. <laughs> So what's up? What's up? There? Yes, the, the, <laughs> they can find us on Twitter at Phil Knobs and on Facebook, and right? YouTube, YouTube. <laughs> the show can be you can listen on iTunes. Did you mention iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, <laughs> Stitcher? <laughs> all of all of your hateful comments, <laughs> Richard the Morganator. He Morgan. lives for them. He lives for them. <laughs> So so, what's what's up? What <laughs> what's up next? Something maybe, not as horrible. Maybe though. something you will like. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Today <laughs> it's not looking good, is it? He woke up on the wrong side. Of the <laughs> I guess so. All right, so we got the Born. Ah, that franchise. Is, there we go. Well, that is something I can get behind. Coming in at number forty-one on on our list. Definitely. Um, now, I've seen everyone except the um, uh, the Michael Renner, or the Jeremy, excuse me, the Michael Renner, the Jeremy, <laughs> the Jeremy Renner version. That was, um, 
Oh, was that that was just entitled uh, what was it? Born Legacy. Mm-hmm. I did not see that. I have to say that, but um, I saw that one. I liked it. Well, I should say I liked the first three. Uh, so you did like mm-hmm. Born Legacy. So he was a a pretty good replacement for mm-hmm. for Matt Damon. At least that one for that one movie. Mm-hmm. However, Damon comes back for the 2016 uh, Jason Which Bourne. I, I didn't see that one. I you're not missing anything. That was pretty. It was disappointing. It was it was flat. It just mm. it just kind of see you know it was as opposed to the first three that I saw, and and, and possibly to the you know well to the one that you saw. Uh, I couldn't speak for that one, but you know those movies were kind of it seems like it reinvigorated a little bit of the the, the action genre, the spy type you know movie. Uh, the 2016 I thought was just, just just tired you know just kind of a tired movie <laughs> uh but i really especially the born ultimatum that that was probably my favorite one of the of the bunch we'll have to go back and rewatch these yeah matt uh matt damon was well cast there uh and and well cast and believable and you had a couple of you know pretty good directors involved in those earlier movies you had paul greengrass and uh doug lyman well, the box office increased with um, the first three, and then uh, the fifth one with Matt Damon coming back. So, wait a minute. They all so wait a minute. They all they increased up to the Born Legacy. The Born. So the, when, when it, it trailed off when when Renner came mm-hmm. in for that one movie, mm-hmm. and then went at least it was back up the. Um, Jason Bourne, 2016, was up from the Renner mm-hmm. movie. And it looks like Bourne Ultimatum, which I thought, if memory serves me right, I thought the first three had you know pretty generally really good reviews for all three. But I want to say the Bourne Ultimatum kind of was, was the one that had the, the better reviews on average. And it was the highest grossing, mm-hmm. it looks like, maybe at 546 million dollars off of a 160 million dollar budget Mm -hmm. again adjusted so it was the most expensive and it did (laughs) it did the best and it did the best yeah i I think it showed the action sequences in that movie were just dynamite oh well they were getting all of them well as good as of reviews as the born movies received they didn't receive nearly as well as good reviews as our next franchise which is the Godfather franchise. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that's really not to say anything bad about the born, you know, no, because uh-huh. not many movies <laughs> going to have any franchise are going to have better reviews, at least than the first two Godfather mm-hmm. movies. Um, yeah. Those, those movies kind of, uh, the first movie, kind of remade Hollywood in a little bit. It was part of the the new Hollywood, what they called the new Hollywood back in the early 70s that uh where the director, you know, did become king for a little while and and um <clears throat> you know, had a lot more control on average uh, uh I think than than they have at any time in American movies. And and you know, that was the first Godfather was a very troubled production that I think Paramount might have actually been close to firing the the young director uh, of of that movie, uh, Francis Ford Coppola. At, at first, uh, they didn't. <laughs> I don't think they had much faith in it. Turned out to be all right, I guess. <laughs> Turned out to be okay. And it's one of the and as good as The Godfather was, um, you'll find a lot of and, and The Godfather, you know, tops out on a lot a very respected all-time great movie list. Mm-hmm. You know? If it's not number one, it's certainly within the the top five. But uh, a lot of critics will argue that The Godfather 2 actually even better than The Godfather. And it too, like The Godfather, won Best Picture when it came out in um, 1974, I believe. And then The Third Godfather... Not near, not not quite up to the the first two critically, um, even though yeah, it, it wasn't 
it wasn't bad, but it was in, by no means in the, the same league. And poor, I say poor, she's a very successful director now, Sophia Coppola. Uh, she, she decided, or they decided that she, you know, she played the female lead in that, basically. And, um, well, as an actress, she's a great director. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, one of the one of the more important uh, series of movies ever. Where does it come? So what does what is the Godfather? I'm very curious about the fir- the first one was just so popular. Uh, what is the adjusted gross for the original? An astounding one point six billion dollars in today's money. Oh, that's even a little bit more than I thought. That's way up there. So that's going to be way up there on on the all-time list for sure. Way up there. Good lands. For for an in- individual movie or for the franchise? For for an individual yeah. movie. That's that's, that's huge. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's a top tenner right there. Um off of what was the budget? Just over 42 million. So they they adjusted. They achieved some profit on that movie. To put it slightly, yes, yes. There was definitely some uh some good Italian meals could be bought uh, <laughs> with the money made money made from that. Wow. And of course it made an offer they couldn't refuse cuz they made a second one. Right, right, right. And Am I looking at that right now? This is nothing to you know, nothing to sneeze at. Two hundred ninety-six million dollars, but that is significantly lower mm-hmm. than than I'm, I'm. I'm surprised that it's it's that much lower because we're looking at just a couple of years difference there. Wow, that's a shocker. I think that's one of the, the stranger things I've seen. Yeah, you know, that were because again, Godfather in nineteen seventy-two. Best Picture winner, multiple Oscars, as was The Godfather 2, which came out only two years later. So it was the first Godfather was just a cultural, you know, touchstone. It was, it was a phenomenon. A, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And th- all right, so what did the, the underachieving, critically underachieving part three make? Uh, just over $129 million. Off of a hundred and four plus oh, million well, dollar that, that, budget, yeah, that was definitely um, the problem child of of this of this trio. So I don't know the backstory, but do you know why they waited so long to make the third one? Because the third one, you know, came out in nineteen ninety. The second one came out in nineteen seventy four. I really don't know, you know. Of course, The Godfather, based on uh, Mario Puzo's novel, and um, I I don't know why it was so, so long. Maybe they thought they couldn't. Maybe they thought, <laughs> we can't. Look, we can't we've lose. struck <laughs> lightning, gold, whatever, platinum uh, with these first two. There's no way we can top that. And it appears they were right. <laughs> there was no way they could top it. Um but I don't know. That's an interesting question. And by gum, I'm going to have an answer for you sometime later. <laughs> Not right now, but um, I will check in. It also goes to show you what's in a name, right? Name recognition. But then also sometimes you have to have more than just name recognition for something to to keep going. Or or if you do a reboot. Yeah, yeah, right. So So your good name, right? Your good name doesn't guarantee good box office your good name your hey your godfather may have been something special but you <laughs> you little punk <laughs> that's a god you're gran- not your godfather the god grandfather maybe there yeah. you go I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess uh i guess sometimes it's it's hard to make sometimes it's hard to make money going back to the past right <laughs> right yeah but sometimes you can go back to the future oh what a segue. You've been waiting for this all. You've been waiting for this, haven't you? I have. <laughs> Back to the future. Um, so yeah, the, I guess that was a somewhat um, a somewhat <laughs> successful series of movies. <laughs> so it ranks at number 38 on our list. Okay. 
came out in 1985 to the tune of just over $909 million adjusted. Not bad from a, what was it, a $45 million budget adjusted? Mm-hmm. Not bad. Yeah, that, that movie, <clears throat> I think, is one of the most purely entertaining movies that I can think of. I can watch that. It's one of those I can watch over and over again. I've seen it, you know, numerous times, but it never loses its its magic with me. It's just great. It's just great storytelling magic. Yeah, it's like one of those perfect storms in a good way. You know, where everything just came together for that movie. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and I'm I'm pretty sure that movie wa- wasn't on many people's radars back then, even. Even though it should have been, because the previous year, uh, Back to the Future's director, Robert Zemeckis, had directed another movie that kind of um, came out of nowhere, an an action movie called Romancing the Stone, and another movie which I truly love. Uh, So he'd made that, and then a few years prior to that, had made another very solid comedy that... um, not enough people seen called Used Cars, starring Kurt Russell. And, you know, with both of those movies, uh, the leads, the male leads in those movies, Used Cars and, and Reminds of the Stone, um, both of those lead actors had uh, were having maybe a little bit of trouble at the box. They weren't guaranteed box office draws, right? Uh, Kurt Russell was kind of stuck in made-for-TV land at, at the time Used Cars came out. And then Michael Douglas was having... As far as being an actor goes, he's having a little bit of a, a lull in his career before um, Romancing the Stone took off. And the same applied with Back to the Future. You know, Michael J. Fox was primarily known or was known as a, a television actor. And so, you know, he was by no means a box office draw. But, you know, they rolled the dice and, um, well, <laughs> it seemed to work out. Well, our next franchise on the list catapulted another TV star into movie stardom. That would be Die Hard, coming at number 36 on our list. Bruce Willis. Yeah, he was um, So he was known mainly before Die Hard, before playing uh, police officer John McClane. He was known... Uh, for and I can't remember his character's name in Moonlight. It was the television show was Moonlighting, mm-hmm. with uh, co-starring with Sybil Shepherd. And then what was he made one? I guess one other Hollywood movie before mm-hmm. what was uh, the uh, the comedy um, Blind Date? Blind Date, right? That came out somewhere around eighty seven, and then Die Hard in eighty eight, and and yeah, much like Michael J. Fox once. Once Die Hard came out, um, it was he waved, he waved bye bye. Goodbye, TV. television. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a movie star, <laughs> and it'd be hard to blame him. But I'm shocked. So I'm looking here. I'm looking at your your um, your list, your spreadsheet, and it has Die Hard with this adjusted uh, gross at, at just three hundred and four million dollars. I would have thought it would have been higher. So would I. I mean, yeah, I was thinking ah, at least five. It's, it's Die Hard. You it's know. Die. Yeah, every just virtually it seems like every action movie for for decades, even up until now, just somehow it seems to be a kind of a riff off of Die Hard. Somehow, so, at least a lot of them, not everyone, but certainly a lot of them. Um, yeah, I, I would have expected it to to be higher up than it's like, that. You know, Die Hard's become the standard by which everything is measured. It's certainly, yeah, I look at, I certainly look at it as the, you know, the forefather of the modern, you mm-hmm. know, of, of, of the modern action movie. It's basically what Star Wars did to science fiction films. It's like that tent pole that, by which everything's measured. Right, it's kind of measured, it, yeah, measured up to, yeah, definitely. And then... So this is where I get to play, you know, uh, Mr. Sourpuss <laughs> again. I I don't like any of the Die Hard movies after the original. I just, you know, I don't like. I, I can live with Die Hard too. Um, it's 
I mean, it's a rehash, but it's it, it's pretty competently made, not aggressively stupid. But some of the the other ones after it, I ooh no. I, I'll go one more with you. I like Die Hard with a Vengeance. So, so you went th- to the to the third one. See, right. I couldn't. I can't make that journey with you. <laughs> this is where you know that 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 you know <laughs> that frontier. I sh- I shall not cross with you. But maybe I like it more just because Samuel L. Jackson was in it. And I'm a huge Samuel L. Jackson fan. Well, I am a huge Samuel L. Jackson fan, but I'm just not a huge fan of that. So even he wasn't enough to carry you no, over? No, no. It was just too... Look, I know... It was outlandish. Movies like that are not... You know, we're not supposed to look at them as, oh, that can happen. But I just thought that was aggressively, you know, aggressively... Uh, illogical in places. I was like, no, <laughs> no, not even for this. I'm not going to buy it. Nope. I mean, how many times did I say that? Oh, that would have killed somebody, you know, right. doing that <laughs> right. in real life. And- uh, yeah. I, I don't know. It just, uh, and then the last, uh, a good is, so what was the last, is it a good day to die hard? Was that the last movie released in the franchise? Yes. Um, 2013 release. Yeah. That was really, that was really bad. That was a bad movie. That was like um, a direct video. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, again, it's it's nice because hey, we're, we're film knobs. We we have the power to not count anything if we don't want That's to. Right. right now, you count. You know, you count at <laughs> least one more than I do. But yeah, you know, and all of you out there. Listening, you have the power. <laughs> you can you can decide which one of these movies are canon and which one aren't. <laughs> Join the rebellion, <laughs> the knob uprising. The knob uprising. That's right. We can, you don't have to listen to anybody. Um, I, it looks like the most successful one as far as just sheer sheer gross uh, box office adjusted would be. Uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance at six hundred and eleven million dollars off of a, oh, you know, a, a hefty one hundred fifty million dollar price tag, as mm-hmm. a, as opposed to the originals, quite tidy sixty million dollar mm-hmm. budget. And you know, thinking about actually thinking about back for a second to the having the power to. You know, to to count what you want to, to include what you want to, and to just dismiss anything else. Uh, I, I thought I saw where you know there's going to be a uh, a possible future Die Hard movie, uh, at least in development now, uh, that I'm going to be able to ignore. <laughs> it's it's tentatively titled McLean, which is I guess going to be a I think it's supposed to be a prequel of sorts. But yeah, so it it doesn't exist yet. It right I, right it does not exist. <laughs> Yet, <laughs> nor yeah, and it may not exist ever. <laughs> but it probably won't exist ever in in my mind. <laughs> and if I remember about it, isn't it supposed to be a prequel? Yeah, yeah. I I, I think that's a know, prequel to Die Hard. I, I think so. So pre die pre die hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, McLean. McLean. And who are you going to have to? That's a good question. Who, who would you cast? Who would you cast as a young John McClane? I, I was going to say, are they going to, going to age reverse <laughs> Bruce Willis? Well, Bruce is sixty four. They'll definitely have to around sixty four. They'll definitely have to. Uh, the bionic man. They had the technology, you know, to age reverse him. <laughs> well, they certainly. I'm, I'm, that technology is getting uh, better and better, which you know. It's cool in a way. It's also very scary in a way. I mean, you know, and it's expensive. <laughs> these deep fakes are are. There's no telling where this is going. <laughs> there's no telling where this is going to end up. Well, B man. Speaking of movies that you may not want to count in the, a franchise canon. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to Men in Black. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> Coming in at number thirty-five on our list. Men in Black. Well, I'm, yeah, of course, what was it? Was it two weeks ago that um, Men is Men in Black International, right? Right. Uh, was dropped to absolutely, it seems like no fanfare at all, literally. <laughs> um, I, I believe 
the opening weekend gross was uh, just barely above thirty million, which is not good. It was number one. Not, you know, it's number one for the week. Yeah, but look at what it came out against. So I'm not sure that even the yes, that came out number one. Hurrah! But I want to say the lowest um, entry in the franchise previous. Uh, it was like 50 something million maybe for, for an opener, mm-hmm. an opening weekend. So yeah, that's uh, not good. And the review has been pretty scathing, but, but you know, let's don't trash at least the, uh, the original was, I, I really enjoy. I thought it was a fun movie. I did enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, me too. I'm a huge fan of the franchise. So I, I was pulling for men in black international. I was too, because you have a couple of actors that have shown, you know, uh, that they have chemist from chemistry, mm-hmm. Hemsworth and Thompson. But uh, yeah, the reviews have not been kind. I I know the uh, the IMDb score is is bad. Uh, I think Rotten Tomatoes it sits somewhere in the twenty five percent range. Yeah. I hope this doesn't speak you know to Chris Hemsworth's career future <laughs> because he, you know he was in the <laughs> Ghostbusters <laughs> disaster. Then he's uh, was in this one, so he just needs to. I stay. hope it's not him. He you know. needs to stay out of reboots slash, <laughs> you know, uh, sequels. It's, it's, except if it's a Marvel, right? Stay as Thor, right? Right, exactly, right. <laughs> except except for that. Um, yeah, the first one with Will Smith and and Tommy Lee Jones though was so good because. Both of those actors played so well. You had you know Yin and Yang; they were right. so completely opposite. Right. Um, and you know, I didn't really care a lot for the second one. I, it, it to me, it was just kind of flat. The third one was a little bit better to me because, especially because it had Josh Brolin does an amazing riff off on Tommy Lee Jones' character, as, you know, as the younger, uh, the younger Tommy Lee Jones character in Minute Black, but. And it also proves that the audience loves the Buddy Cop movie. That's what Men in Black is. It, yeah, at its core, you're exactly right. You get the two mismatched cops, in this case, yeah. Um, alien cops, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one, Men in Black, came out in 1997, and it made just over $928 million. You see, that's... Uh... That's a lot of money. And yeah, it goes back to remember how surprised I was, or we both were at mm-hmm, the the, mm-hmm. Uh, the die hard right. numbers, and um, yeah, and then we get nine hundred and twenty nine million for Men in Black. What was the budget? Uh, adjusted budget was one hundred and forty two million. So how did the two inferior? Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, certainly. Like I say, I don't want to rag on them too bad, but they were inferior to, yeah. the, to the first one. How did they turn they just, out? They weren't as fun. I don't know. No, no, you're right. They, they weren't. Um, the budgets in, increased, I, I guess, salaries. Right. And maybe you know, production, special effects, whatever. So the second one cost um, almost $198 million, and it made 622 almost $623 million. And then the third one, it looks like, if I'm looking here, budget goes up even further. Wow, 238. Uh-huh. But the, the, the gross actually went up a little bit on the third one, back to, to 726 mm-hmm. million. So I'll be honest with you, though, those uh, uh, grosses for, for two and three are higher than I thought they were going to be. So I guess that's why Men in Black is. Um, so a look- little higher in the. <laughs> Although it's not going to get, it doesn't look like it's going to get a whole lot higher, <laughs> even with a new well, edition. We don't have that. We don't have those numbers in, right? For uh, right, you know. but it's like we talked about with Independence Day. You know, Will Smith being in a movie versus not being in a movie, and that's why I'm kind of concerned about Suicide Squad. You know, because he's not attached to the Suicide Squad two anymore. Right, and it's not like. I mean, Suicide Squad made some pretty good money, but it's not like it was the most well-received movie true, either. True. And then you add on to that, or subtract from that, if you will. You know that that Smith's not going to. 
Idris Elba, though, as far as acting goes, he now he is the replacement, correct? For, for a different character. I don't think he's... Di- oh, he's not... Uh-uh. Oh, so that character... That's right. That character is just not in... At all. The, okay. I, I, I don't know if they've announced which character Elba is playing, but he's not playing Deadshot. I mean, he's not what we consider a box office draw right now, although it'll be interesting to see. You know, he's going to be in a, a big budget movie with a lot of box office expectations here in just a, a few weeks, uh, the, the Hobbs and Shaw. The Hobbs and Shaw movie, Idris will be the, the villain. And now that I look over at our clock, it looks like I am going to be uh, the villain here uh, today as well. Well, I guess I've already been, <laughs> I've already been the villain somewhat a couple of times today, but uh, it looks like our time is is running short for this episode. Um, uh, I, I know we're going to come back to it next week. We're gonna we're gonna keep going until we until we reach that uh, that summit of franchises. Uh, but until then, how in the world uh, do all the people out there in pod, the podcast world, the podcast first, how can they uh, talk to us and tell us, um, you know, their own thoughts about the franchises, what we've been talking about. Uh, you know, are these fair? Are the numbers fair? Are they not? Um, whatever your thoughts. Like a hit, hit us up on Twitter. We're at Film Knobs. We have a Facebook page. We have a Pinterest board, a YouTube channel. They can listen to the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Stitcher. And we certainly do look forward to hearing from you. Until the next episode, everybody take care.